All right, so we're going to hear from Nick uh, regarding their discussion. All right, so our discussion covered a lot of different issues. Uh, one important thing that got discussed pretty early on was uh, investment in community infrastructure. Um, we didn't touch on all the nuances that got brought up in the panel, but just the importance of, oh, can everybody hear me? Great. All right, sorry. All right, uh, so one thing that came up uh, at the beginning of our conversation was sort of an investment in community infrastructure uh, beyond just, you know, physical, you know, community centers and parks uh, and events, but just building a sense of community is really important to uh, creating a value and an incentive for people to stick around and want to be part of a city. Uh, you know, if you had an unlimited budget, there are lots of things that you might be able to do to facilitate that. Um, other things we talked about were issues related to development, um, just like prohibitively high costs to rehabilitating an entire city. Um, we talked about you know the great work that nonprofits are doing, you know, but. Uh, 30 people in a city of nearly a million is um, a drop in the bucket and it can, and it can seem frustrating. Um, you know, uh, there seems to be different issues in different places in the country. So one thing that we brought up is that, um, you know, there may be uh, issues of crime and uh, stripping resources out of old homes in some cities. That's not an issue that is universal or uh, necessarily problematic to all communities. Um, and in fact, uh, what we've seen in Detroit is that there's not really that issue of people coming in and stripping homes the way that you know they may be portrayed in the media or in other kinds of places. Um, uh, and then we kind of ended uh, with conversations about um, what can be done. Uh, sorry. Oh yeah. Oh, local and municipal kinds of opportunities, and so. Uh, reforms that cities could make that could you know, have huge impacts. Uh, one thing we talked about was sort of tax reform. Uh, and so just, you know, there was a panel this morning on uh, how you know, tax incentives led to this huge crisis in Detroit. Presumably this is happening in other places, but just uh, having fairly assessed property values that are realistic to what the community can afford and what uh, you know, reflects the value of the homes that they're actually living in rather than these like hyperinflated values for people that are living in poverty. Um, so those are some of the things we talked about. All right, so we discussed a, a few um, options for if we had unlimited money and, and resources at our disposal. Um, we brought up restitution, which I think Professor Steinberg mentioned in his talk um, to those people who uh, lost their homes already and did not benefit from Morningside. Um, we also mentioned funding nonprofits who are helping out with this crisis. Um, also restricting blight and economic development takings, uh, which was Professor Salmon's uh, recommendation. Um, investing in our communities. We also talked about reforming the laws of a small town in Michigan, and without knowing much about this small town, we said that it might be better to decrease restrictive zoning and decrease regulations uh, that separate residential from commercial um, areas. We also talked about um, it not being useful to have a us versus them mentality and uh, living in a community that really takes care of its people and doesn't allow uh, them to be homeless. Um, let's see, what else did we have? And where geographically does property dispossession need to be reformed? Um, I think the Rust Belt uh, cities are, are noteworthy um, and other distressed cities that may be uh, considering municipal bankruptcies in the future. Um, under the question, what is the most expansive reform possible? We were discussing some Supreme Court decisions that uh, maybe overturned uh, Kilo versus New London, as well as Berman v. Parker. Um, we also mentioned getting rid of blight condemnations and having more realistic uh, assessment rates for property taxes. There was a couple of themes that really came out of our conversation. One was accountability and needing the government to be accountable to the people and the people to be able to organize without uh, having strings attached based off of who their funders are and how that's controlling um, 
the political activism. Uh, and then we also talked specifically around uh, various ideas of housing reform and the way there are kind of smaller, although still very big reforms like uh, repealing rent control preemption or what do we do about these land use contracts and how can we have legislation that reforms that but then coupling that with the real solutions that need to be in these bigger ways like how the state needs to respond to the history of racism here or um, shifting from a culture that prioritizes a landlord's rights to evict a tenant over a tenant's right to housing. So we talked about a lot of stuff that um, I don't know if I can do justice to the details of, but I um, will try. So we talked about um, having a, uh, a sort of a private land bank buying properties in the city and um, and trying to you know revitalize those. We also talked about legal restrictions on predatory um, rent to own uh, contracts. Uh, we also talked about enforcing accountable standards on the land bank so that the land bank isn't just um, you know, sitting on properties and having them stay blighted or selling them to speculators who are just allowing them to sit there but making sure that whoever buys those properties um, you know, fixes them up and contributes to the community rather than speculating and, and waiting. Um, and we also talked about raising consciousness about unjust zoning in Detroit and sort of heavy industrial activity that causes a lot of pollution and problems for people in communities being right in residential areas. Um, so those were all things that we discussed. Awesome, thank you all so much for um, taking the time to chat with each other and share thoughts. I think it's amazing that we spend a whole day learning about a topic that maybe we know a lot about or maybe we don't know anything about. And it's always really wonderful to take a, an opportunity to think about where we can go from here, not necessarily just hear stories where you think, oh, that really stinks, like, I wish we could do something. So I hope um, you all take a, uh, take a moment and, and appreciate your own work and appreciate the work of everyone else. And then we're going to close um, the day with Professor Atua Honey. She's going to give us a little overview of the day and send us off. So thank you all so much. And I know everybody is tired and wants to go home, so I will be sure to be very brief. Um, all right, so just uh, thinking about what we covered today, um, in the first panel, we really talked about dispossession as not just happening in Detroit, but being part of a larger historical narrative. We really learned about the dispossession that happened in Chicago through these unjust land contracts, uh, the ways in which uh, debt is being used as a mechanism for dispossession, and of course the historic and ongoing uh, dispossession of Native peoples. Then we moved into talking about bankruptcy. <clears throat> and the most interesting questions to me around the bankruptcy were, um, in fact, you know, number one, with a lot of these bankruptcy proceedings and emergency management, the question is, you know, has there uh, been a dignity taking? Is the actual, you know, is it kind of this idea that um, you're broke and then someone comes in and they're trying to fix it, but in the process of fixing it, uh, is there a dignity taking that is being uh, committed? And uh, that's something we really need to, those of us interested in dispossession, we need to really be uh, aware of and cognizant of. And then we broke up into the uh, smaller groups and really dove down deep into Detroit and all the complexity of the D Detroit case with the present uh, dispossession happening through the property tax uh, foreclosure crisis, not only dealing with how we know there's a property tax foreclosure crisis in terms of the data that informs policy, um, but we also um, looked at how the property tax foreclosure crisis maps onto other dispossession. Josh Akers did a really good job of, of um, breaking down the processes, right? There's a system that leads to bad outcomes, and I think he did a really good job of, of teaching us how those individual pieces all come together to produce these bad outcomes. And of course, we heard from Mike Steinberg about the Morningside litigation and what resulted from them, uh, which is, you know, which is a complex use of the right of first refusal uh, and the make it home program are kind of what came out of that, the victories that came out of that. And you all heard about that uh, in those smaller sessions. Then we had a really kind of uh, revitalizing conversation about revitalization. 
uh, and renewal. And I think the uh, main thing there is, you know, we really learned about all the challenges of renewal. What does, what renewal looks like to one person is not what renewal looks like to another person. Um, and I think the real lesson we learned there, again, is to make sure as we renew, not to commit another dignity taking. Just like as we go through emergency management, we want to make sure um, that you know communities are protected but most importantly i think the one of the important points about this is in this panel is nobody is against development although uh you know this is uh what some people like to say no one is against de development it's about different ideas of what equitable development looks like and that's really uh, what it's about and then we had our wonderful panel of activists um uh, who really just started the process of giving us hope. I think that's what Mary Kate wanted me to do in kind of this sum up is she did, you know, dispossessing Detroit, my God, right? How, how, how it, it's just so depressing. Um, but we need to start talking, you know, there, there, there's hope here. Uh, and I wanna leave us all on a hopeful note. Um, and the hope is really in the resistance. The hope is in the resistance. And this panel really showed us, started to show us what the resistance looks like. Right? Uh, we really heard about the challenges and the resistance happening in Del Rey. We heard about the uh, resistance, really, that's, that's happening for our native communities here. The resistance there is, is resisting this invisibility uh, that is being thrust upon you. And I shouldn't call it Detroit, I should call it Wawi uh, Tanong. All right, I got a thumbs up on that. All right. <laughs> And for the Prince fans in here, you'll, you'll appreciate um, that means the, uh, the town formerly known as Detroit. <laughs> and then Sonia Bonnet, of course, did a fantastic, remarkable job at really kind of uh, uh, starting the conversation about the resistance happening um, to the foreclosure crisis. And I want to end by giving especially Michigan uh, students some ideas of opportunities on how to plug in. So, you know, we have the Coalition to End constitutional, Unconstitutional Tax Foreclosures, which is a coalition of about just about a dozen grassroots organizations who are committed to accomplishing three goals. I mentioned this briefly in my opening comments, but I want to tell you in this moment, just use the next three minutes to give you an idea of exactly the campaigns we're working on and how any students in the room um, want to plug into the work, can plug into the work, and be part of the resistance, right? So our first demand, as I mentioned earlier, earlier is to stop unconstitutional tax assessments and we have really two main strategies. One is top down and the other is bottom up. So the top down strategy is, um, I, uh, in my remarks I mentioned that between 2009 and 2013 our estimates show that anywhere between 55 and 85 percent of properties were being assessed in violation of the Constitution, the Michigan State Constitution. The good news is at the top of 2017 the city uh, did a complete reassessment of every residential property, which they had not done for 50 years, according to the city. And so those unconstitutional assessments have improved, but we redid our study and found that the lowest valued homes are still being unconstitutionally assessed. And so what we're advocating for is the assessor to do an across the board cut. Uh, he's claiming, uh, so, but th that unfortunately you think would be an easy ask, but it hasn't been. And so that's gonna be a political fight to put pressure on the target, which is the assessor, to do this across the board cut. But we're not waiting for that to happen. We have a bottom-up strategy where we, the reason <clears throat> where we are helping people file the appeals, because that's the number one reason that this tax inequity happens, is higher valued homes, uh, they, they, they have businesses that file the appeal for them, or they have the education and time to do it themselves. It's lower people who, who, who live in poorer homeowners who don't have the time nor the skills to do this uh, very comp complicated property tax appeal. Um, so we, ha we are trying to, act we are doing those appeals for them for free. And so those are the two strategies, one top down, one bottom up, to really accomplish this goal of stopping unconstitutional property tax assessments. The second goal is, you wouldn't believe it as I mentioned, but on, uh, despite all of this evidence, and it's not even being contested by the city, like the assessor, uh, has already said, you know, a, you know, he's not fighting the study, saying it's wrong. So no one is fighting this idea of unconstitutional tax assessments, but they are still nevertheless foreclosing on people. 
uh, and, and their argument is that, well, if you thought you were unconstitutionally assessed, you should have appealed. So now it's an issue of personal responsibility, and you thought that and now it's your fault. Not that we're systematically over-assessing you, but that's the logic that takes place for, to allow them to continue these uh, foreclosures in the face of uncontrovertible evidence of unconstitutional property tax assessments. So what we're asking for is for them to, to do a moratorium on all foreclosures until we can make sure that each and every property foreclosed upon was not being illegally assessed. And for that, we have two real, um, uh, the coalition has two things we're getting behind. Number one is, as you heard, the Make It Home program, which came out of the Morningside uh, litigation, and that is being run by United Community Housing Coalition. They have a program that anyone who qualified for the poverty tax exemption, and hence should not have been paying the property taxes that is leading to their foreclosure in the first place, the litigation allows us to pull them out of foreclosure. And so the, our real strategy as a coalition is to support UCHC by making sure people know about that program. And, and the real problem is trust. Uh, uh, is because you actually have to give over your property to the state to participate in the program and to get it back. And so people are having trust issues. And so although we have this great settlement, we have really low numbers of people participating because of these trust issues. And so as a coalition, our, our goal here is to really get behind UCHC to help them increase that trust factor, to get more people participating in the Make It Home uh, uh, program. The second uh, strategy of the coalition is to um, get behind a, a program that is coming from the Wayne County Land Bank that is trying to erase the taxes of everybody who qualified for the poverty tax exemption. If any of you know about that, this is the Wayne County Land Bank, they have proven to be untrustworthy in the past. And so our main proposal there is to, they're doing this all kind of in the dark, uh, behind closed doors, I'm saying bring it to the light get community input, allow community accountability in that process. But we are 100% behind that program, trying to make it a success. We're just trying to open it up to kind of increase accountability. And those are our two um, kind of main strategies at the moment we're pursuing to achieve this second goal, which is stopping the impending foreclosures. The third and the final goal is, again, as I mentioned earlier, you just can't be you know, unconstitutionally assessing people and foreclosing at record rates and then just talking about oops, we need some compensation. And so as uh, uh, um, Council Member Castaneda Lopez said, it's the, it's the unity of the three. We got the policy, uh, we got the community organizing, but we also need the politicians. And in this case, it was Castaneda Lopez's uh, uh, comrade in arms, Mary Sheffield, Councilwoman Mary Sheffield, who's leading a, um, um, a working group that is investigating the question about compensation. And it, she's convening all the various city departments uh, to really explore what is possible. And so that's what we're really working on with Mary Sheffield is through this working group, really trying to figure out what is possible as a first step, and then as a second step, really trying to push through, uh, depending on what's possible, an ordinance to really uh, start uh, with compensation. But we're not waiting for that working group. In the meantime, we started something which Sonia Bonnet is, she didn't mention this earlier, but she's the director of the Dignity Restoration Housing Program, which in the meantime, we're actually giving houses to people who were unconstitutionally assessed and for closed on for taxes they shouldn't be paying in the first place because they qualify for the poverty tax exemption. Sonia was the first recipient of a house. Uh, we also had Sabrina and Joe. We had two other recipients of the houses. So we've, we've housed three people in that situation and we by no means, that's just a drop in the bucket, but the real goal there is to give the houses and to do a, a media campaign around it to really put this issue of compensation into the public discourse. That's really the goal there. Because we need to start talking about compensation, right? Uh, uh, and so that's really our goal um, through the Dignity Restoration Housing Program. We know we're a small coalition without the capacity to rehouse everybody, but we wanted to give the houses back to really, again, uh, start this really important conversation about, um, about compensation. And so last is, I want especially to the Michigan students in the room, the change starts with you. Um, <clears throat> as many of the speakers said, you guys are living right next to, you know, there, there is, 
a fantastic movement happening you know so we we yes there's dispossession happening and yes there's resistance and you can be part of that and there's different ways um, that you all can be part of that um, the first is the coalition is a very unique organization I told you it's about just about a dozen um, nonprofit organizations but all of the work done by the coalition is done by students students in Chicago students at Wayne and students here in Michigan Mary Kate and Casey are they here they are two of the students that have that in the room <clears throat> that have participated and been doing and been the worker bees of the coalition and if you're interested in getting involved at that you can do we do it through an independent study you can talk to Mary Kate and Casey about that the other way is um, um, is to help us be through research assistants I have my ridiculously amazing research assistant here Elizabeth Helpling who is amazing and she just decided she wants to graduate. <laughs> Go figure. So we're looking for more research assistants in this project to do this very important work of really getting to the bottom of things. So that's a second way you can intervene is by being a research assistant. Uh, and the third and final way, which is a new thing that we're really starting, um, through the Detroit Justice Center, we have the um, uh, community paralegals who help with the property tax appeals, but in addition to that, to support them, we're also starting a project of students who are gonna do the property tax appeals. Um, and that effort is being led by Marie, who was here earlier, is she here now? She was here earlier, and one of our students, Marie. Um, but if you are interested in getting involved in helping with the appeal project, again, we're launching that. At, uh, it's a joint project between Michigan law students and Wayne law students where students are going to jump in the fray and help to do these appeals. So again, those are just three ways totally at your fingertips that if you are outraged by what you heard today, by the level of this injustice, and it really is a shocking injustice happening just in your backyard, these are three of the different ways that you can actually do something about it because change starts with you. My last words I just want to say is this conference has been amazing. It's been, uh, you know, I've been thinking about these issues for now over five years, um, but I learned so much today still, right? After having been so deep into this, I learned so much from you all, from the speakers, from the questions being asked. Uh, and I just want to do a really special shout out to Mary Kate to end this, who is... <laughs> who has been the mastermind behind create, not only you know, initiating this conference, putting it together, and really if you notice all these innovate, a lot of us here are conference aficionados, right? But there were so many innovations here like this, the thing we had here at the end where we're talking about solutions, the, um, the different kind of quick, we have breakout groups at conferences, but not 15 minute breakout groups. There were just so many amazing innovations that were just ridiculously successful and contributed to our wonderful day that you will, I, I hope you all agree that we had here today. And so I just, and this work, it can be thankless, right? So I really just want to thank Mary Kay and the whole team really involved in putting on this conference for the hard work these students have done. And so with that, I just want to say thank you all for coming. <laughs>